The mesh is a large system. It uses novel cryptography, metacryptography. It uses a novel naming infrastructure, the UDF, and it introduces a new cryptographic syntax, data at rest envelope. And it is designed to provide security for the user, not just for one application, but for any internet application they may use. So the question I'm asked a lot is, why did you start with something simpler? In this presentation, I'm going to answer that question. Hello, I'm Philip Pound Baker, and in this presentation, we're going to be looking at the original use case that motivated all the work on the mesh, securing end-to-end -end secure email. Making end-to-end -end secure email exactly as easy to use as regular email. And that was the original challenge that I accepted when I restarted work on this type of cryptography uh, five years ago. So the original objective of the mesh was to enable mail and to, and as we started to look at what it would take to enable S-Mine and PGP on each of these uh, devices, uh, it was quickly realized that we might as well configure mail at the same time. So what the mesh provides is a configuration file that has all the information that a device needs to configure uh, IMAP, POP3, submit, and all the keys it needs for open PGP and SMIME and anything else. And so that is the original use case that uh, we came to with the uh, mesh. So what do we need to do to activate open PGP? Well, there's, of course, there's a, a, a question that comes up here. Alice has multiple devices. So she has her watch, her tablet, her desktop. Do we want to create a different key pair for each of these devices? Or do we want to share the same key pair across all of them? And while we could backfit our key splitting metacryptography to OpenPGP and also SMIME, that would require us to change the existing programs and we lose the advantage of the legacy base. The legacy base is pretty much predicated on the assumption that each user has a single public-private key pair for encryption and it doesn't really have the ability to make use of multiple signature keys for a user either. And so the first decision that we make is we're only going to support a single uh, key pair, uh, at least in, as far as the initial rollout of using the mesh to configure OpenPGP. So the first thing we're going to do is to configure, create ourselves a public private key pair. And then we use the mesh to create an activation record to instantiate that key pair in each of our mesh devices. The, we can also, the administration device when it's doing this, is also going to create as, as a contact. So we'll create ourselves uh, a contact for you know, contacting us by email and we'll automatically add our PGP key into whatever that uh, contact statement is and do what's ever needed to update, necessary to update that. It can also, when, uh, when we upload our um, synchronize with our mesh service, the mesh service can also offer the service of updating uh, Brand Lamachia's um, MIT key server. I 
I guess it's probably called something else these days, but. So we'll update the PGP key server as well as part of that process. So as far as the user is concerned, all they need to do to enable PGP on all of their devices is to simply set, go to the administration device say, I want PGP, bang, they've got it on all of their devices. It will be picked up automatically next time they sync and though each of those devices should then be able to install the PGP key into whatever PGP aware mail program they happen to be using. Okay, so that, that's the first part. So at this point, we've configured Betamax to do end-to-end -end secure email. What if we got VHS? Well, the steps for SMIME are pretty much the same, with one important advantage and one important disadvantage. The advantage is that SMIME is the email encryption solution that's already in almost every client that's out there. The disadvantage is that in order to turn that encryption on, we need a digital certificate that has been issued by a trusted certification, certificate authority. And that means that we need to either go to a certificate authority and persuade them that if they give free certificates to MeSH users for personal use, that this will help build them build a market for enterprise deployment of SMIME and secure email generally, and this will help them down the line. I think I can make that case. If not, well, we'll have to try and persuade Let's Encrypt to set up a free CA. So we need to get the certificates from somewhere. And if we get that, we can then read the mail on any, re read, receive and read encrypted email on any of our email clients, just as if it had been sent unencrypted. And so we've solved the reading part of the end-to-end -end email problem. What we've still not done is solve the problem of how to send it. And the reason for this is before we can send an encrypted mail, we've got to get the public key of the recipient. So if Alice is here and Alice is wanting to send a message to Bob, Alice needs to have Bob's public key before she can send it. And that's a bit tricky because traditional email clients, you know, they they don't have the real mechanism to manage public keys. And okay, yes, so Outlook and so on, if Alice installs Bob's certificates in Bob's in, in her contact for Alice, if, sorry, if Alice installs the certificate from Bob in her contact entry from Bob, she can send email to Bob encrypted by just clicking the encryption button. That part's good. But it still isn't really, we still got to get the right certificate, you know, because Bob's certificate is going to be expiring after a year and the way of getting the new certificate hasn't really been completely thought out. And so what we've really got to have is a mechanism so that when Alice is sending a mess message to Bob, the mail server that is sending it out, or the client she is using to send it, has to be able to know, okay, we want to send this message to Bob. I need to go and get a certificate you know, I need to apply best effort encryption as I send this message. I want to send this end-to-end -end encrypted if Bob allows it. And so we need to have a database out there in the cloud somewhere that either the client or the service can co contact and find out, is there a Bob certificate here? And can we apply it? And so this is one of the reasons for wanting to establish that internotary so that there's an infrastructure that can provide that type of information and also the critical information of Bob prefers encrypted email. You see, today, if I get myself an SMIME certificate and I've only got it installed on one of my 
eight devices, then that means that if somebody's sending me encrypted device, e email, I can only read it on one of them, which might mean if they send me an email uh, when I'm on a, a trip abroad, I may not have the ability to read it until I return, which, you know, is probably, it might be what they wanted, but in the general case, it's not. So until we've got some infrastructure out there that allows either Alice to collect a contact from Bob that gives Alice a means of getting the up-to-date certificate for Bob, or alternatively there's an e a general uh, purpose infrastructure that allows Bob to say, send me encrypted mail by default, we, we, we can't use S-MIME except by special agreement which means that we end up not using it at all. Which is, of course, the same thing that happens with OpenPGP. You know, OpenPGP is underused because there's a penalty of using encryption, which is the recipient many times isn't able to read the message at all. And, yeah. So we need to have a means of sending the mail and a means of telling the recipients mail infrastructure that it should be it can be sent encrypted or it must be sent encrypted and so here's how we do it we use strong internet names so if alice's uh, regular email address is alice is alice at example.com we can create a strong name from this by inserting either her mesh fingerprint or her PGP fingerprint or her SMIME fingerprint into the email address as a strong name. So that in, if we want, if we put it at the end of the DNS name, which is of course the beginning, mmm dash f m a b q whatever dot eg dot com if we insert a fingerprint at the start of the dns um, name this is an, a dns name that we can um, fix up the dns hierarchy and fix up alice's mail server so that mail sent to this address will go into Alice's regular email inbox. So we've got a way of providing backwards compatibility for her email, which is powerful, of course. So Alice can uh, pass this email out and anybody who's been given this email can now send her encrypted email because she they know that end-to-end -end encrypted is what Alice preferred. It is implicit in that address. If we're in certain circumstances, you know, say Alice is a lawyer or an accountant or a spy, and she really wants that uh, email to be sent encrypted or not at all, what we can do instead is put the, uh, the strong name component at the beginning or rather, well, put it at the pinnacle of the DNS address, uh, which is the last segment. And so MMM dash whatever, we put the fingerprint there. And now we've got a DNS name that won't work on the regular DNS. You know, this is a reserved uh, prefix that, uh, you know, is reserved for protocol use, not for ICANN use. And so this is a DNS label that can only be used for creating strong names. And so this is saying this name will not route on the regular internet. It can only be interpreted by a mail client or a mail server that is strong name aware that knows to process it as a security policy and apply it to the sending of the secure email. And so now we've got a way of giving out an email so that somebody can send me email that will go encrypted or not at all, which is really important when it must be sent encrypted. Okay, so we've got a mechanism here that allows us to create 
to, to configure email clients to send and receive uh, encrypted email. We're still missing one little bit, which is a shim to go into the infrastructure so that when, the mail, when a regular mail client that hasn't been modified is sending email, that uh, that strong name enhancement takes place. And we've got three basic approaches here. Approach one, we can, uh, on, since we, we're configuring the email client on the device, if this is the device, and so within the device there's an email client here, and normally the mail goes out to the outbound submit service, what we can do is to install a, a mail proxy that is strong name aware on that uh, same machine. We can divert all the mail through the proxy, which is essentially doing, instead of a man in the middle attack, this is a man in the middle enhancement on the mail taking place in the user's own machine. So this is on uh, 127.0.0.1. So that's on the local loopback address. And so we can send the mail out to the proxy on the same machine, do the enhancement here, and we still get end-to-end -end secure mail without having to upgrade Thunderbird or Outlook or whatever they happen to use as their mail client. So that is one option. Another option is that we can take that uh, strong name uh, interpretation stuff and we can put it in the mail server and the submit server can be enhanced to recognize strong names and when it sees a strong name it will automatically wrap the mail in whatever SMIME security enhancements are indicated by the bound security policy. So this is not quite end-to-end -end secure in that the, the client that sends the mail off to the, ser the service, the submit service, is not going to encrypt on the mail on Alice's machine and then be encrypted all the way to Bob's machine. It's going to be, but we are going to have start TLS. We are going to encrypt the outbound submit hop, hop using TLS. And then when we receive the mail, we're going to be enhancing that mail as we receive it. And so we won't ever store that mail in a plain text form on any service anywhere, which means that we're never going to have that mail in a form where it might be vulnerable to being you know, compromised or whatever. So we do have that advantage. But you know, it, it's less good. And of course, the best way of all would be to upgrade the mail client, uh, which is fine. But if we're going to upgrade the mail client, um, that will give us the full end-to-end -end of Alice all the way through to Bob. But if we do that, well, why not change the client completely and introduce a mail client that uses mesh messaging as the mail transport. So that if we've got that, we've got no SMTP legacy to defend. We've got no mind processing to be bothered with. We've got, uh, we can have all that nice um, traffic analysis resistance. Um, we can have the anti-spam piece built in. Anything that is not a very short text message is going to be sent as a detachment that's going to be pulled instead of pushed through the infrastructure. So we get all the advantages of that uh, protocol ar architecture. And because access control is built in, uh, Alice and Bob aren't going to get spammed to be, you know, to what's it? So, and we can still provide uh, the same anti-malware pieces and so on as we do today, but there's much less need for them because Alice and Bob are not receiving, you know, they, they can decide who they receive attachments that has macro 
have, have macro uh, extensions or executables in. We move from the current SMTP, which is default permit, to a default deny stance where stuff doesn't, where the default is we don't accept the mail sent in that way. So it's a bet, so we can move from the current SMTP infrastructure to the infrastructure next. So if we do, changing the client is powerful, but if we do, I'm just warning you, it is a slippery slope. And you know the thing about slippery slopes? There are some slippery slopes to go down gingerly with crampons, and there are other slippery slopes to go down on skis. So in this podcast, I showed how we apply the mesh to make end-to-end -end secure email just as easy to use as regular email. In fact, the user doesn't need to see any difference at all, except that those email addresses have become a little fancier and longer. But apart from that, that there's no change. And that completes the series of three a podcast showing how we apply the mesh to each of the three killer applications of the internet. Mail, web and remote terminal access. You know, web, mail and SSH, you know, cover a lot of ground. And as you've probably been seeing, as we get to applying the mesh to other systems, the discussion becomes a lot more open and there's a lot more unfinished business. And, you know, we're getting to the point here where I can't do it all. I can't, you know, I can design a PKI, but I can't tell everybody all the ways in which to apply it to everything. Nobody can. I need your help. I need people to help me build the mesh. And there are many separate parts of the puzzle. Besides, you know, getting involved in the mesh itself, getting involved in applying the mesh and making use of it is just as useful. We need to build a developer community and I'm asking you for your support. So please like the video, please subscribe and please consider becoming part of the mesh developer community. And the next video is going to actually be the last of this video des describing the technology of the mesh. And in that video, we're going to be considering a piece that is something that I'm planning to spend probably the next six months looking at, which is how do we make the mesh service efficient and how do we make it scalable and how do we administer it as a, an open service. And so that's going to be my research focus for the next six months. And in the next video, I want to show you the types of approaches I'm thinking of applying. And besides being applicable to the mesh, I think there's something that a lot of other service-based uh, applications might well be able to make use of that same approach. So please click like and please subscribe and please join me for Mesh 20, how we apply the mesh to the mesh. Thank you very much.